Okay, so what I want to talk about today, I want to talk about time, uh, photonic time crystals. What is interesting about photonic time crystals, it's, it's something completely new. Actually, this wording of photonic time crystals, the reason that, uh, uh, that we invented this word and we get some fire because of that, because it relates to some other time crystals that are not related at all, is because the other way to call it would, be, would have been uh, temporal, uh, temporal photonic crystals, which is not good because temporal photonic crystals gives you the feeling as if there is something there and then it disappears. So this is, uh, it lives only temporarily. Anyway, so these are the, this is the Technion team, you know, topological photonics started pretty much in, the, in my group. There was a precursor to that, topological electromagnetism, microwave, that started my former student, Marin Soljacic. That's, uh, I think, uh, Andrea referred to Marin as the MIT group. <laughs> it's my doing, it's my scientific son. But uh, in these days, I'm moving slightly uh, out of uh, topology because we found something new, and I think this is the next big thing. And actually, the group of uh, Vlad and Sasha has a lot to say in that. So now we started to collaborate. They were actually pioneers in looking at what happens in time-bearing fields. So the Technion group is listed here, and I'm graduating now three excellent students. One goes to industry and the two others. This one goes to, to Shanghui Fan, and this one goes, he has two offers, he needs to decide. We'll see. And the others, we'll see. So, what's the story? Huh? I'm not sure that I can use. So, it seems to me that this doesn't work, so I'll use this. Huh? Maybe now? Okay, okay. Okay, so this is the story, hopefully. No, no, it's okay now, Vlad. So, if you think about a crystal, a crystal is a periodic structure. Any crystal is a periodic structure. You need to have some kind of a repeating structure, a unit cell. And usually, we are used to think about it of crystals that are either atomic crystals or photonic crystals, they have dispersion curve, which says something about frequency or energy as a function of momentum or K. Now, sometimes they happen in nature as it is. For example, if you look at the at crystals that we have on day-to-day -day life, it happened by nature. You know, metals are crystals, generally. And uh, sometimes also photonic crystals can be natural, not in 3D. But in 2D, you can find them, for example, on the wings of, a, of butterflies. There's something that looks like a 2D hologram. So it's a 2D variation of the refractive index, but usually not in 3D. So photonic crystals usually are not spontaneous. Now, what, in order to be in the regime of 3D photonic crystals, where you have a complete band gap in all three dimensions, then and then you need to have a, a change in the refractive index that is on the order of one. And so you can see this is a 1D photonic crystal. This one was invented, discovered by Lord Rayleigh, chances are even before. Okay? Nobody called it photonic crystals. This is a 2D photonic crystal, which there was also quite a lot of work. I think probably the first one that looked at something of that sort is Yariv, and then after that, uh, uh, Phil Russell. And then there is the 3D photonic crystal. It seems to be like an extension, but actually it is not. And the reason that this one is not, and this one is really important, uh, was the reason that it was uh, gained importance is because of Ilya Blonovich, a good friend, now at Berkeley. They wrote a single lot of paper, and the title of the paper is Inhibition of, photonic of uh, Spontaneous Emission in Photonic Crystals. And the reason it is important, even though there's nothing like this in nature, is because of the light matter interaction. And what he saw, and I will get back to it later on, that in a 3D photonic crystal of that sort, there is a complete band gap. And then in that band gap, there's no spontaneous emission. And as a consequence of that, you can get thresholdless lasers, lasers without threshold. And there are many, many, many other applications. Okay, so this is just the background for photonic crystals in space. Now, photonic crystals, are photonic time crystals are crystals in time. What does it mean? Imagine that you have a bulk material that is completely homogeneous, just to make it easy, okay? And then the refractive index changes from epsilon one to epsilon two. What you get, what I will show you today, is that this structure has, creates uh, band, bands and band gaps in momentum, but they are rotated by 90 degrees. Another thing to mention is, that in this time, in this structure, energy is not conserved. Why is that? 
it's like a capacitor. So you charge and discharge a capacitor with the modulation, changing the epsilon, changes the capacity. So therefore, it, the energy is not conserved because of your breaking time translation symmetry. On the other hand, if the medium is homogeneous or is large enough and homogeneous, then momentum is conserved. Okay? Another thing is that now, so it seems now that the conservation laws are different, but if you have a band structure, as I will show you, the band structure is rotated by 90 degrees. Another thing is to think about interfaces or how quickly, how fast this will change. So we are all familiar with Fresnel equations. We are all familiar with what happens in space as we go from one medium, say air, into another medium. And we know how to calculate the reflection and transmission. And we know that when the index contrast is large, we can get them to be comparable. We can, and we know about special angles of uh, total internal reflection and Brewster angle and so on and so forth. Everything that we do in the undergraduate class has to do with an abrupt interface. Never a gradual interface. Do you know why? Because if you make the, in, the, if you make the, the interface gradual, you minimize the reflection. The, reflection. the transmission will always be there, but reflection will be very, very, very small, unless you are under uh, a total internal reflection. So that's the idea. So in order to see the interfacial effects, to see the time crystals, to do something analogous to that in time, what we need is to have a change in epsilon that is on the order of one optical cycle or slower. Because if you, or faster, because if you make it slow, you will have time refraction, but no time reflection, and you need time reflection in order to create a time crystal. So at the temporal boundary here, the material needs to change fast. And there are boundary conditions and so on and so forth. So what I will do today, I'll give two lectures. The first one is just a, an overview of what's going on. I will not teach you here how to calculate. And then we'll take a break. And the second one, I will actually teach you what to do what are the boundary conditions and how to go for it and so on and so forth. So I'll try to cover a list of topics. Let's see, maybe it will spill into the second lecture and then, okay? Uh, so I'll talk about the fundamentals, then I'll talk about topology properly, and then I'll talk about photonic time crystal containing disorder and what happens to localization. Spatial temporal, I have just one slide because the rest will be in the details. And then you may ask, okay, look, this is, until now it was electromagnetism. What made Ilya Ablonovich's work so profound, such that it is the most cited paper in optics in the last 40 or 50 years? He has 20,000 citations for a simple paper. And the answer to that is just one, light matter interaction. So what we are interested in is not only in the electromagnetism, which is until here, but actually all of this. In other words, dipole emission, first classical, and then quantum vacuum fluctuations, amplified spontaneous emission, lasing in the time crystal, and also Cherenkov radiation, Cherenkov-like radiation, and experiments in the very end. Okay, so what's the story? So we are looking at a material that is completely homogeneous, and we want to change it in time. So usually the, what we really should write in all the books, the way properly it's written, is the following. So the electric displacement vector is a function of the electric field. But there is usually memory, in, in the most general case, there is memory in the system, which means that the field, the time t, affects everything that started from that point and on. Okay, so usually it's written like this. Okay, so the way that you think about, you need to think about this uh, in, in, in the frequency domain, simply by Fourier relation, is to think about like something like convolution. Okay, so if, here it is a convolution and here it is a product. So we usually are working here. In other words, what we do usually, we are saying that epsilon is constant in time, usually. It's a material property, doesn't change. Only the electric field of the light changes. So therefore, we can take it in the, into the extreme that the response, the, the electric displacement vector is a product of the electric field at frequency omega times epsilon at the same frequency. Okay? What we are interested now is exactly in the opposite regime. We want to look at what happens when we are having something is instantaneous. So there are no memory effects. Okay? So this really signifies the regime of the changes in the material properties on the scale of the optical period, of the optical cycle. Okay? Now if you think about 
reflection and transmission of Fresnel equations that I just told you, then let's first of all do what we know. This is what we know, that's what we teach, okay? So we have some material at some plane uh, point uh, in space at Z0, you change from epsilon 1 to epsilon 2, okay? And then what happens, comes a wave, the wave comes on a linear slope like this. Why is that? Because the re relation between them is the speed of light, okay? And then it comes here to the interface, okay, this is time, okay? So it's 1D material. So this is Z, so it comes here, the, the interface, and part of it is transmitted, part of it is reflected. That's what you usually have. And we can know how to calculate Fresnel reflection as a function of, of, the, uh, of the polarization and as a function of the other coordinates and so on and so forth. What happens here in the temporal, if we are looking at what happens on temporal interface, which means that we abruptly change the refractive index or epsilon of the medium, what happens is two things. Okay, the same, we have same trajectory, same initial uh, speed of light. Then we have time refraction and time reflection. Notice two things. The first one is that time refraction, when we have here time refraction right here, then what will happen to it is that we necessarily will have a new frequency. Now why is that? Because momentum is conserved. So if momentum is conserved, the frequency cannot be conserved because you've changed here epsilon, and therefore you necessarily go to a new frequency. Just by looking at what happened before and after, you have one abrupt change. The other one is, look here, we have a reflection, Fresnel reflection in space, so it goes backwards in space. We would have liked to have a time reflection backwards in time. At least Vlad and I, that we are over 60, would like to have that for a while, for a while, <laughs> maybe 10 years. <laughs> but it's impossible. So therefore, time reflection is also in space, goes back in space, not in time. This was actually written the first time in the 50s when people did radars and microwaves by Morgenthaler. You can find it in a book there that he didn't think about all the physics I tell you now, but the continuity in this he already calculated. So there are several things to say. First of all, the, and this is some references the, to papers that were there. First of all, the time refraction right here was observed. I think the, it's fair to give the first one that really observed it, and I will tell you later on why this TCO, these are practically speaking transparent electrodes, material that we use for transparent electrodes. Okay, so uh, in the time refraction was arguably observed. Not all the properties were observed, but it was there. The first time I think by Vlad and Sasha, and then after that, actually, who did not really make a, a claim but they were the first to observe. And then after that, there is a paper that actually made the claim by a group of Bob Boyd. Time reflection of optical waves has never been observed. Why? Because you need to change epsilon on the order of one within one optical cycle. And that's tough. But there was something related, a guy by the name of Peter Alevi, actually is a graduate of the Technion, he's an old timer, an old antenna guy, graduated from the physics department at the Technion, one of the, of the two departments that I'm affiliated with, and his real name is Peretz, but he lives in Mexico, nobody knows how to say Peretz, they will call him Perez, or Perez, so he called himself Peter, to make life easy. So he actually, uh, they did experiments in transmission lines, and they saw, the, they saw momentum gaps. They never, really did not measure the time reflection directly, but they saw it. So it's still a challenge, and the one that rose to the challenge was not in electromagnetic waves, but in water. This is a friend of mine by the name of Matthias Fink. And what he, what he did is like this. He understood all this business, and, and what he did is the following. He created a chamber with water, okay? And then at some point dropped it, okay? So the surface waves on the water are reduced by gravitation. So by dropping it, you remove G. So you change the phase velocity of the surface wave in the chamber. So what he saw is this. Okay. okay, let me explain and then I'll run it again. So what he saw is this, okay? Quite fascinating. He put a little statue of the Eiffel Tower, of course he's French, he's from Paris, so you put it in, and then when you put it in, you dimp it in, you see the wave, the surface wave going out. And then you drop the chamber, and what happened 
is that it goes back in space with the conjugate phase. So they go back, the waves go back and redo or reform the Eiffel Tower. Okay, let's see it again. Okay, so this is the dip it in the water. You can see the waves going out. Now he removes the Eiffel Tower, drops it. Oops, he removed it. Now he drops it. And you can see that the wave come back because of the time reflection and recreated more or less the Eiffel Tower by the, by the waves themselves. In other words, this is, so it is a phase conjugate reflection because the phase right here is conjugate of the phase that was in incident. So therefore, you think about this as a now superposition of waves, you'll understand how, so each one of them is phase conjugate, so they go back. But this was done only in water. With electromagnetic waves, there was never a demonstration, not even in microwaves. This is the closest as it got. And, but even that is not really a time reflection. What they measured is that there is a little bit of a band gap. So this summarizes the technicalities. Okay, in the second hour, I will teach, I will tell you how to calculate. So in a photonic crystal, we have refractive, this is 1D, huh? but you can do it for 3D. Uh, for a refractive index, has some periodicity, it changes periodically in space. The easiest way to post it in the wave equation is through the magnetic field, which is, here we are talking about time harmonic, you can separate because the material properties do not change in time, and you get to this equation. Again, this is the correct form, write it. The eigenmodes are Bloch modes. Bloch modes means that these are e to the i omega t, in other words, they are, uh, they are uh, all time harmonic, and there is some Bloch momentum uh, times a Bloch function, which is a periodic function. So if you look at this, this is how it looks. The Bloch mode is periodic in space with periodicity A. The dispersion curve is bands, which is the blue, and gaps. And we all know what happens, for example, if you are incident on a photonic crystal in the band gap. What you get is total reflection. Yeah? Now let's do the same thing with photonic time crystal. So now we have material that the refractive index changes periodically in time. What you get in an equation that looks similar. Not exactly, it's not exactly the same because of the tensorial, uh, the, the vectorial properties, but other than that, it's the same. The eigenmodes now are Fluke modes. What is the difference between Fluke mode and Bloch modes? Same idea, same mathematics. Only those are periodic now with the period of the oscillation, T. Okay? The dispersion curve is rotated by 90 degrees. So now you have gaps in momentum. Just a moment, you have now gap, bands and gaps in momentum. What happens now if you launch a wave that the momentum resides in the gap? One would think everything is reflected, but this is wrong. So this is the story. So let's say that we have a 1D photonic crystal, comes the light comes the light here, and the light now partly is, now if you are in, let's say, in the band, not in the gap, if, so part of it is transmitted, part of it is reflected, okay? If you are in a time crystal in the band, part of it is uh, time refracted and part of that is time reflected. Now to understand the essence of it, think about what will happen if you put an atom or you put a, a, a source, a point source, in the structure. So if you put the point source in this structure right here, okay, and it associates, uh, it emits light that is associated with gap modes. So what will happen, the mathematical solution for the modes in the gap is exponentially going up. Now if you put it, let's say here, this is a point Z, Z0, then you'll have from that point and on, you'll have something that goes up in the positive direction and something that goes up in the negative direction. There are two solutions. But, Conservation of energy, I remind you this, conserve energy, okay? They are all stationary in time. Conservation of energy removes the tails. So what we are left with is a source that emits in the gap, it emits only evanescent fields. Evanescent fields, which means that the electric field of the light goes down exponentially, the magnetic field of the light goes down exponentially, and how does the photon flux go down? What do you think? Let me be interactive with the audience. How does the photon flux go down? I can tell you that I asked some of my colleagues and they didn't know, they gave me the wrong answer. So I will ask Soham. Soham, how does, so if the electric field here of a vanescent field goes down exponentially, the magnetic field goes down exponentially, what happens to the photon flux? It doesn't, it doesn't move at all. It's zero. Because there's all evanescent waves in electromagnetism, there is always a pi over two phase shift phase between the electric and magnetic fields. 
So therefore, if you look at the time average, which corresponds to the photon flux, it is zero. Okay. Okay. So this is why. So what we. This is why. If you. This is why. What Yablonovic told us that if you put an atom that can emit something in the band gap, it will not emit. Okay. Now, in time crystals, the story is different. Why? We are now not restricted. We again have two solutions. Only now we put the point source at time equals t naught. In other words, we have one flash of light, tuck, and that's it. And you ask yourself, what will happen now? Now you are not restricted by conservation of energy, so you don't have a problem with something that will blow up. Why is that? Because the modulation in the refractive index gives you a source of energy. It can charge whatever, uh, whatever seed signal you have. But you are restricted by causality, unfortunately. So if you launch a flash of light right here, what will happen? You have two solutions, exponents diverging and exponent decaying. Okay? Before the time, this is gone, this is dead. But from that time and on, those two are alive. The one that decays exponentially is not important. Why? Because it decays. The one, it's overtaken by the one that blows up. So actually, if you have a light source that is emitting in the momentum gap, this, the light will be amplified, not can be, but will be amplified by the modulation in the medium. So from there, you can let your imagination run, and I will get to it, but you can immediately think about creating perhaps photons, let's say classically, you can amplify, you can have an, an optical parametric amplifier, okay, that without any resonance. I'll get back to it in a minute, okay? So I want to, I will let you ask in a moment, I want to show you a simulation. This is FDTD simulations. And first, let's look at what happens if you have a pulse that is sitting in the, in the band, let's say here, okay? And let's see what happens to the pulse. So let's look at what happens here. This is time, okay? So first of all, you have a temporal interface when the modulation starts. And now we have modulation, up, down, up, down, the, refractive, the epsilon of the refractive index, and then it stops. So the first thing is that here at the interface, the pulse splits in two, as I showed you before, time refraction, time reflection. Inside it, it propagates according to the eigenmodes. If the, if the pulse uh, is associated, you can decompose it to, uh, to band modes, it will propagate and accumulate dispersion according to the dispersion in the band. Okay, so what we did, we launched a wave packet that sits here, the center is here, only in the band, no gap. Okay, so here it will propagate inside. By the time it gets to the, the far end, you again change it to have a temporal interface, so you again have refraction and reflection from the another temporal interface. Okay, so there are three stages. First, you come, the light will come here, it will split in two, then it evolves according to dispersion band, and then again it splits in two. So let's see it. Okay. One split, another split, okay? This is when it is in the band. The band is not extremely interesting. Why? We understand that you can engineer the dispersion, you can engineer, which means that you can engineer the properties, the phase velocity and the group velocity of light and so on. But not extremely interesting. But now let's see what happens in the gap. Same thing, only now in the gap. Okay, so again, let me tell you what you saw. Comes the pulse, now it will split in two. By the time it's here in the gap, pulse, okay? Now it will grow, it stops, slows down. It doesn't stop because it's not infinite, slows down a lot, and then the amplitude goes up. It sucks energy from the modulation. But then it comes here to the other interface, it splits in two. Okay? So wave dynamics in PTC. So again, so this is like a 1D time crystal. So you have a pulse propagating here. This is the temporal interface, it's split in two. And that's another, okay, that's another temporal interface right here. When it splits, each one it splits in two. So in the end, you have like four pulses. Okay, so what is the idea? When the pulse propagates in the band, initially the pulse propagates in free space, and then it enters the time crystal. So at the beginning, or in homogeneous medium, not necessarily free space, at the beginning it's a superposition of plane waves. And then when the time crystal starts, the pulse is projected into forward and backwards, fluke modes. So part of it is reflected, part of it goes through. It's a superposition of fluke modes, and part of it is reflected back, also as a superposition of fluke modes. When the time crystal ends, it again splits in two. So that's what you saw right now, okay? This is in the band. 
Okay. Now, let, now the same thing now, what will happen now in the band gap. So now you have something here, and by the time it comes here, it splits in two, and both of them are amplified at the expense of the modulation. You see that it stays, huh? the pulse slows down. If this was three times longer, it will, you'll really see that it stands here for a long time, but you already see that it, you know, that it comes, now it stops and grows in amplitude. There's no other way, it cannot avoid going in amplitude. There's also a little bit residual stuff that goes down exponentially, but you don't see it, it's overtaken by the, ampli the growth. So the first work that we did on that is that my students noticed that this modulation, periodic modulation of the refractive index in time, it is like the SSH lattice. Andre, I just told you about the simplest uh, topological model, which is like a binary atom lattice. I teach that in the third year semester, not the topology, but the features of that, the binary, a binary lattice like this, okay? So what happens in a binary lattice like this, it, it looks, it here we are looking at something that changes in time, up, down, up, down, to create some, a, a binary lattice of this sort in space, which is what Andrea did, is you need to have uh, waveguides that have two periodicities. So they are um, a closed one, like a, those that are near and then a bit further away, near and then further away. And then when you do that, you have a topological defect, and she talked about it. I don't want to go now into details, but when you do that, and when you do something like this, you need to notice that you look at the dispersion curve, that the, usually what we do, we calculate the dispersion curve. But when you calculate the dispersion curve, there's another property. The other property is the twist on the curve. So for example here, the twist on the curve means that if you look in, in the momentum space, what happens to the modes, to the phase of the modes? Usually the first band on that has the same phase of the modes, so the modes do not twist around. But there are cases where the modes twist around, and this is like the third band right here, where it winds on itself, it's like a Mobius ring. So what Andrea said, she was absolutely right by saying that it's more difficult in electromagnetism to see the topology because it's in momentum space. So the momentum space here, in the second hour I'll exactly teach you how to do it. What you need to do is to calculate really the phase when you go around the Brillouin zone. Here the Brillouin zone goes, uh, here the Brillouin zone, the, the integration is of all the bands, so it goes on this, okay? And then you ask, okay, so what are, okay, so we have bands, and you can say that the phase here, the Zak phase, can be uh, zero pi or whatever. What's the implication? It turns out that the implication is that the, the relative phase between the, the time refraction and the time reflection, the relative phase between them has the notion of topology. Okay? It is determined by the topology of which band you are. Okay? The photons that are generated in the momentum gap have a relative phase between them. And the sign of the phase is governed by the topological invariance, by this zero and pi. So for example, as you think about it, and Andrea just talked about the, this simple lattice of the SSH lattice that it has a topological defect. So here we can generate topological defect in time. Okay? So for example, you are looking at something here, there's some one periodicity, you modulate the refractive index, and then you go and modulate the refractive index in a different periodicity. Now, we are looking at the band gap. So, photons in the band gap, the, the amplitude of the electric field, the, the intensity of the light goes up and up. So now you've changed the periodicity, so you'd expect it to go up again, maybe with some different slope. But if the Zak phase, if this topological phase is different, you'll have an edge state where it means that, that at this time, right here, it goes up and up, and then it reaches a peak and then goes down. Okay, the other thing, so this was the first paper that introduced us into this business. And from here we started to think about it and what we were starting to think about already in 2018 is not only about the electromagnetic properties, which could be, for example, demonstrated with microwaves. Nobody did it yet, but there are some, now quite a few groups around the world are looking into it. Okay, for example, this and many others, but we started to think already at that point uh, when my students suggested that to look at this, they were at that time busy with topology, I told them, look, 
Yeah, we'll do the topology because it's interesting, it's a nice paper, blah, blah, but we need to think about light matter interaction. I want to put emitters in the gap and see what happens. So the next thing that we did, we looked at uh, disorder. So let's see what happens in a time crystal when you have the modulation, it looks like this. Okay, let's say you do it in time segments, but now of different amplitude, around zero. Okay. So what's the story? The story is the following. What we know since Philip Anderson, 1958, is that if, the, uh, if, the, if your medium, if the medium in which you are, uh, the, the potential, if the potential uh, has some disorder in it, in one dimension and in two dimensions, then this leads and the wave is coherent. It happens only with coherent waves. Then you'll have Anderson localization. In three dimensions, you have a mobility edge, which means that you need to change the, mag the magnet needs to, to surpass some value. But in 1D and 2D, it is the, the wave becomes localized. This is the reason why, for example, uh, some materials will not conduct if you have enough disorder in them. Um, in 2007, we did a pioneering experiment here where we showed for the first time Anderson localization of light. And about a year after us, a friend of mine, Elena Spey, did ex similar experiments in 1D with cold atoms. Now there are different challenges now and so on and so forth. In all of this, if you want to localize something, you cannot afford to have temporal variations. Again, if you want to have Anderson localization of light or cold atoms, of electrons or whatever, the potential, including the disorder, should be stationary in time. Why? Because until 1970-something, it was proved that if you allow the potential to change in time, or the effect even to change in time, then you kill the coherent effects. As a result of that, the wave interference does not interfere uh, destructively for ongoing uh, uh, evolution but rather you'll, you'll kill it completely and you go back to diffusion. Several years ago we showed, this is 2012, we showed that this is untrue. We've shown that if the, if the temporal variations are fast enough, you can actually have the scattering will give you a signature that is a transport that could be faster than light. So in principle, the issue of what will happen now if you have a material that is completely homogeneous and then now let's modulate the effective index in time, let's even do it periodically, but with random amplitude. What will happen? Okay, this is the question that we ask ourselves. And what we found, so it looks like this. Okay? So what we found is that in this case, ah, okay. So you have a, now, this is a simulation here, and you have many, many, many cycles here, and you can see in a moment, up, up, it stops and, and localizes and, and is amplified exponentially. Usually with Anderson localization, the Anderson modes are all of them decay exponentially. But this is a time crystal. So in a time crystal like this, what will happen is that the amplitude actually blows up. So what will happen now is that the pulse energy increases exponentially in time, rather than it's not a conservation, it's not a conserving energy anymore. So the amplitude goes up. The pulse propagation comes to a halt when the disorder starts and the pulse shape becomes distorted. It's Anderson modes in time. Does it make sense? Well, photonic crystals create band gaps with exponential decay. Disorder consists of many, many special frequencies, so it induces localization, creates little, little band gaps, and induces exponential decay. In time crystals, now we have the modulation like this will create little gaps where you will have exponential decay and exponential increase. The exponential decay is overtaken by exponential increase. And therefore, temporal disorder, which consists of many temporal frequencies, induces exponential increase of intensity. And this is an example now. We took some refractive index, let's say, and we, we chose some bias of two, some arbitrary number, and then we put some variations here that we chose randomly in the computer between minus one and one. Okay, when A is equal, and they look at what happens in the coefficient A. When the coefficient A is zero, then there's no disorder, there's, then this is low disorder and stronger disorder. And let's see what happens. So for one thing, the first thing that we found out is of course that when you put disorder into the system, then the energy goes up, okay? Exponentially, so this logarithmic scale. The other thing is that we saw is they looked at the velocity. So when there's no disorder at all, 
the velocity is the same. But you put this order, the velocity goes down. Again, everything is exponential here. And then we look, did it first for something that material that is uniform, and then, and then just modulate it like this. But we put some variance, and then we said, okay, let's put time crystal, which is, this is now periodic, and on top of that, put a variance. Effects are very, very similar. What happens if you go not only to a material, not just change it randomly, but change it actually periodic, something periodic in time with a little bit of disorder, then the group velocity determines the strength of the localization. More recently, we looked at what happens in the spatial temporal photonic crystals. Uh, space lattice is known for a long time. Time lattice, the first paper is actually Biancalana, and then this is the Peter Alevi paper here that I told you about. This is, I just unfold, we just unfolded the, uh, the dispersion map. And then the next question is what happens when you combine the two? Actually, we reported it in a clear paper, and uh, there were not enough results to write the paper at that time, in my opinion. I said, okay, we can do it in clear, but I want some more juice. My student was a bit lazy, so some uh, Korean group was a bit ahead of us. So they published in optics letters, but there's a lot of interesting physics, and it is now under review in uh, Optica. And I will show you in the second hour uh, some details of that because it's extremely important. For example, it turns out that when you change a lattice in both time and space and you can create two gaps, one in energy, the other one in momentum, and at some point they can start to overlap and they, when they completely overlap, they collapse into a point which is a high order exceptional point known from non-emission photonics. Extremely interesting. Okay, now I go to the juice. The juice is light emission in, for, in time crystals. And I go back to Yablonovich. That's what Yablonovich told us, that if you, this is the dispersion curve, you put some emitter here, it will not emit, okay? And so the history is like this, that photonic crystal have been studying one form or another, huh? but no one used the term photonic crystal until a hundred years later. We give credit to Sajiv John, but with all truth, Sajiv John talked about localization, not about inhibition of spontaneous emission. So the credit, in my personal view, should go to Eli, only to Eli, on that. And the paper, most, most of the community actually gives the community to, the credit to Eli, and this is his paper, a single author paper. It is also interesting to notice another thing. We talk about spontaneous emission. Spontaneous emission is a completely quantum effect. I mean, we can describe it phenomenologically, like we do in a, in, a, in a first laser class, but it is a quantum mechanic effect, spontaneous emission, because in order to have spontaneous emission, you need to have vacuum fluctuations. Without this, then there's no spontaneous emission. So one would think, okay, so this paper is actually about quantum, yes? How many times H-bar appears in the paper? Zero. Not even once. In other words, Eli said, all the physics without using H-bar. And he was right. Okay, so based on this idea, if there's no spontaneous emission uh, at all, then you can create a defect mode, and then you can have lasing from the defect mode, but you have now only one mode. So usually the threshold of the laser, the reason that we have a threshold is that you pump atoms to higher level, and they can emit not only into the mode that you want to lase, whether in a big cavity or in a waveguide cavity or whatever, but also to the environment around it. But in a, in a, a photonic crystal, in a 3D photonic crystal, there's, only, uh, there's no modes that you can laze into, so there's no spontaneous emission at all. And then if you create one defect mode for a particular polarization and so forth, then it will emit spontaneously only into that defect mode, therefore the, the threshold of the lasers can be zero. This is actually an idea that uh, was suggested later, not in Eli's paper. The first time it was demonstrated in 2D system was the, uh, the PhD student of Amnon Yariv, Oscar Painter. It is really Yariv's idea at the time. And, uh, and this was 2D, which means that they created a 2D photonic crystal with some rods. Okay? In this direction, it was just a waveguide, so it, there was threshold, but the threshold was reduced. And Noda, a year later, demonstrated the whole concept in 3D photonic crystals. So it's obvious to ask, what will happen now if you have a time crystal and you have an emitter in a time crystal, what will happen? So there's some similarity to an effect known as the Casimir effect. What is the Casimir effect? 
Casimir effect, the one that you know, that some of you may have heard, is actually take two mirrors or two interfaces, okay, like this. So they form a cavity. So inside the cavity, you have a discrete set of modes. Outside it, you have the world, so it's continuous. So now let's look at what happens in terms of quantum fluctuations. At a given temperature, some thermal equilibrium with something. So what will happen now in, inside, between the two plates or the two mirrors, the two interfaces, you have a discrete set of modes. They are maybe allowed to be infinite because vacuum fluctuations occur in any frequency. Okay, so infinite means that they are not countable. But the number of modes inside, they are discrete. Outside, it's all continuum. So as a result of that, what will happen is that the quantum fluctuations create pressure. Outside, you have many more modes than inside. So the two plates or the two interfaces are attracted to one another by virtue of, of the population of the modes by quantum fluctuations, by zero, practically, okay? What is the dynamic Casimir effect? Similar thing when you move the mirrors. Okay. So it is a bit similar to what we do, because what we do, we don't have any mirrors, we just have a bulk material, and we are changing epsilon. So it is a bit similar. Things, some of the things are similar, some of the things are not. Okay. So let's put a point source, first of all, as I said before, in a photonic crystal, 1D photonic crystal. So we have a photonic crystal, 1D, and we put a point source here. So what will happen now in the photonic crystal is that you have modes, that are exponentially decaying and exponentially growing. You have exponentially growing in the positive direction of x and the negative direction of x. Conservation of energy tells you that this growing mode, this part cannot be, is not physical because system conserves energy and also this part. So you get something that looks evanescent. Now let's do the same thing, similar equation for time crystal and ask yourself what will happen. So as I said before, I was able to guess that it must be amplified, but that's not the whole story, okay? And it will be amplified like this. Also one D amplified. Now, in order to solve it, what you need to do is to find the green function, which is a big deal. I have a good Russian student that was not well educated, but he's smart, so he was able to find the correct solution. And uh, a green function means that you want to find the, the response of the system to what happens when you turn, when you have a delta function in time, a flash of light, and you want to find what will happen. So it looks like this, the green function, and I will show you in a, in a moment what will happen. And you have a green function of the, of the whole system. And now, after you, have, you know what happens to the impulse response, green function is the impulse response, now you can construct uh, any dipole or any current source and see what will happen to it. Okay? And then you'll see in a moment that the current source that you have, the changes in time, will couple to amplified modes, to amplified states, and will increase in emission. Now, imagine that what you have now, you have like a dipole that looks like my fingers, okay, in space. And what will happen now is that you have a dipole, so it goes back and forth. So the, the current goes like this, like the way I drew it right here, okay? Now, there are several cases you can, why did I put it like this? And I didn't want to have a point source. I want to have an extended source, one dimension. It's difficult enough to understand what will happen later. So now I can use this extended dipole that has, that is turned on, you know, we, we, and it goes e to the i omega t, so it all the time radiates. And it, it is, it rad but in only in one direction in a given direction. Why a given direction? Because I want it to radiate, to probe what will happen to radiation in the direction that corresponds to the bend and in the direction that corresponds to the gap. So what you find here is the following. There are four cases. Case number one, which is the simplest, when this extended dipole, it's e to the i omega t, now couples to modes that are on the bend. What will happen then is when you couple to the modes on the bend, you have this, you have something that is oscillatory. Okay, uh, on the bend. So now you are on the bend, so the, the amplitude increases, but it increases more or less linearly. Okay, so this is this. Now let's get off the bend and ask yourself what will happen. Normally, if you think about nonlinear optics, when you are off the bend, then you lose phase matching and you cannot do business. The efficiency is low. Here, it is similar. If you get off the bend, you're sitting right here, so you're off the bend, so the amount of amplification 
or the radiation is nothing. It cannot be amplified by the uh, by the uh, oscillate by the modulation of the epsilon because it's not in phase with it. It's not phase match to it. Now let's go to the gap. Point C. Okay, point C is right here. Now keep in mind, usually when we think about photonic crystals in space, then complex frequency is really imaginary frequency, mostly imaginary frequency. Here, the real part is exactly half of the modulation frequency. So what will happen now for the, all the gap modes? So as a result of that is that if you have your current source, your dipole, that is now sitting right here in this momentum, anywhere here, it is synchronized with the modulation and therefore it can grow exponentially. Okay, this, wide, this one, this figure is in logarithmic scale. Let's go now off the band. Of, uh, oh, not here, it's really in the gap, but off the dispersion curve right here. And you ask yourself, okay, now it's not synchronized anymore. What will happen to it? But the amplification is so strong that you see that at the beginning, there's not a lot of amplification, but then it goes up, shoots up exponentially. So when you are here in the gap, in the directions corresponding to the gap, you have exponential growth of energy. So now that we have one-dimensional extended dipole, at some particular frequency omega, that we understand what will happen, let us now create a point source. So we have a point source, that what the point source does, it radiates at some frequency to the omega t, okay? And we ask ourselves, so it's located only in one point, so it's like an atom, classical atom. And you ask yourself what will happen, okay? So the classical atom is the same spot, right here, somewhere, and the time equals zero, it starts to emit like e to the omega t. And you ask yourself what will happen now. This is the real and imaginary of the bands. You can see the gap in momentum is here. The frequency, the real part of the frequency is half the, the modulation frequency. And right here you can see the, the imaginary part, which means this is the strongest exp uh, exponential blow up and this is the, the strongest expo exponential decay. So now we do this which is just a superposition of point sources that I had, of uh, extended sources that I had before. And if your atom, a dipole, classical dipole emits at frequency omega, whatever it is, then it sits right here. And let's see what will happen to it. So in other words, because it's a point source, it emits to all directions. So some of the directions will necessarily fall onto the momentum gap. As a result of that, these directions, the beginning, they all start with just some oscillations, some power is deposited. But those that sit here are amplified. And because the amplification rate right here is the strongest at a given point, it will the bandwidth will become narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower until it becomes fully coherent. The density, really what happens is that the, you need to calculate the density of states. And another interesting feature here is the following. You would think that when you sit right here, you have emission. Here, you have exponential blow up. So you think that as you go closer and closer to the band edge, maybe at some point, at the band edge, you have the strongest emission. That's untrue. Actually, when you go here, what really matters is density of states. And density of states here is defined, dispersion curve is opposite, is, is rotated, is defined opposite to photonic crystals. And right here, the density of states is zero. So if you put a, take an atom, you put it in excited state, Okay? And you play with the emission or the frequency and momentum of that atom, right here, it will not emit. Whereas if you flip it a little bit into the gap, it immediately emits, exponentially amplified, and in the direction it corresponds to the middle of the band gap, it is the strongest one and eventually becomes uh, monochromatic. Okay? So this is a zoom in into this region right here, into the beginning of this narrowing. Having done that, the next thing was, okay, so we did classical, what about quantum? So that's the story of quantum. First of all, how to find quantization? Actually, it's a tricky business. To do, the, even to do this part, which is the usual part with the given epsilon, okay, that you can guess intelligently. But this one is tricky business. I told you before about my Russian student that found the green function. Here, him and two others of my group found every time a different, a wrong Hamiltonian. The way to do it properly is to go back to quantum mechanics too and to learn how to do 
quantum mechanics three to learn how to do to do here second quantization properly by the book. And what you find is that now you have a, a photon generation that comes in pairs. Momentum is conserved. So photon generation term now uh, is not, you cannot have just one photon creation annihilation, but here you have in the band gap, you have pairs of photons being created in opposite directions because momentum has to be conserved. So they must come in, in pairs and annihilated also in pairs. It is reminiscent a little bit of, uh, of uh, electron positron generation, a little bit. So, and then you can calculate Fermi golden rule and so forth. And I will just show you what it is. So for example, photon generation in a time crystal looks like this. So if you look at the number of photons that are generated, okay, what you, just, um, you want to stop here and continue later? First okay. of all, if you plan to make a break, decide where, and another one, there are some questions coming. Do you need to okay, okay, so let's do like this. I will go back to here, I'll, I'll, so I'll stop here, I'll let you ask questions, then you take a break, and then we go to the quantum. Yeah. And then I will go back to those of you that are interested, and I teach you how to calculate. So let's stop here for now, and let's ask the questions. Okay, so the question uh, uh, from uh, uh, how is it different from parametric Oh, excellent question, I invited it. <laughs> so, parametric amplifier, parametric amplifier is resonant. What does it mean? It has to obey two, con two conserved quantities. The first one is that the frequencies of the, of the pump needs to be equal to the sum of the frequencies of the uh, idler and the signal. And the other one is phase match. So you need to conserve momentum and energy, which means that there is no band gap. Here, the frequency can be anywhere in the band gap and the momentum can be anywhere in the band gap. So if you take time crystals and take uh, the change in epsilon to be smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, eventually you end up with OPA. So the difference is the band gap. Now you reverse the question. What is the difference between Yablonovich and Lord Rayleigh? The answer is the band gap. Other than that, everything was known. Only the band gap. And actually, Eli, I had a, a discussion with this in Eli, with Eli because he reviewed our paper on this in, in uh, PNAS. And uh, he, we argued about terminology for quite a long time. And because of that, I added a section that explains exactly what Narimanov asked. What is the difference between OPAs and uh, time crystals? So that's the difference. OPAs are resonant. Time crystals are non-resonant. Now, where does, it, where does it have importance? For example, think about uh, creating a laser that is non-resonant with anything. You, you all know that OPAs, optical parametric amplifiers, uh, need to be, because of this conservation, you cannot, you, in order to tune them, you need to tune your signal. You need to tune something. But here you have something that you can tune as you like. There's no resonance whatsoever in the medium. And the energy comes from modulation. So this kind of, uh, now there is another interesting aspect of that. Uh, OPAs are known since 19, I would say around, around give or take, were predicted theoretically around 1960. And uh, the quantum picture is a pa famous paper by uh, Yariv, Louisel, and Zygman. But before that, the intuition came from parametric amplifier in electronics. Everything that I said was already discovered in parametric amplifiers in electronics. So what's the difference? Where's the new physics? The new physics is that parametric amplifiers in electronics do not couple to atoms. It's antenna, nothing else. So this is why the importance is major. It some, may sound small, but major. Why? Because antenna will always emit, you drive it with something coherent, will always be coherent. But you cannot co coherentize atoms. And all this interaction induces coherence, just and amplified co amplification, coherent amplification in the band gap. And the atoms remain thermal. Yeah? yeah my, my first question actually was the same exactly the same question about parametric oscillator. Because it's known in mathematics also you have the subject called subject of parametric oscillator. So, so the let me take you to another twi interesting twist. In 1961, and this was the first conference in uh, lasers and nonlinear optics, upstate New York, 
this was the, all the, the, the founders of the lasers from the West came there. Not from the East, not Basov and Prokov, but from the West, everybody came. So the Charlie Towns and so forth and everybody. And in that conference uh, was a question, what is the difference between the classical parametric oscillator, which is known, same what we teach in nonlinear optics, is something that was known in, uh, in uh, electronics 10, 10, 15 years earlier. What is the difference between this and the atoms? Where is the new thing in the atoms? So, so Yariv sat and wrote a paper with Luizel, and then he found out that a similar calculation was done by, uh, by uh, Tony Zygman. And what they did is they actually quantized the field, and they looked at what happens. And what they found out is that if you quantize it, what will happen, you don't need a signal, that you get spontaneous parametric fluorescence. Let me define it properly. You say you have a piece of material, you launch something at omega-3, and okay, so, and you expect it to break into omega-1 and omega-2, that is, the sum is equal to omega-3, okay? Classically, it doesn't happen. One can show, as I show in my class, and it appears in all the books, by Arif and by Boyd, by everybody. You need a seed. If you don't have a seed, a photon will never break into uh, smaller frequencies. But if you add quantum fluctuations, then it does. And this is called spontaneous parametric fluorescence. Several years later, uh, Zygman was already a professor, was a professor at Stanford. His first student was Steve Harris, another good friend. Steve Harris decided he wants to measure it because he read Yariv and, and uh, Zygman's paper. So he was the first one to demonstrate spontaneous parametric fluorescence. A decade later, it was recognized, a decade later, people already knew about entangled states. It was recognized that uh, these two photons that are generated spontaneously from vacuum fluctuations are and, are and must be entangled. And as a result of that, this is to, to this day the best source for entangled photons. Given this, I will let your imagination play and think what will happen when you do it here. The difference here is, of course, this k and minus k must be entangled. As a result of this, we have an interesting source of within a wide band gap, not at a particular frequency.